right, we've hit five o'clock. The time has come. Um, hold it, let me just uh, zoom this down. Okay, great. So it's five o'clock. Uh, I'd like to get started. It's a Wednesday, it's five o'clock, and it's double ninth. Normally, anything to do with the internet in China is shuang shi or double eleven, but we're breaking the rules here. We're innovating and we're doing it on double ninth, which I think apparently double nine is very lucky in Chinese. So double ninth, maybe triple ninth. And uh, Joey has been very hard to nail down. He's all over the internet um, and you know really pushing this China internet report. But as you all join, maybe I ask that you you know as you come in. Put your LinkedIn profile up in the chat group, connect to each other. It's always been our goal with Web Wednesday. One is to learn and see how the internet is proceeding fast and furiously forward. Secondly, to network, make friends, find jobs, find work, etc. Talking about finding jobs, Joey, I saw that you posted just earlier on that you're, you're hiring. Is yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Should I just quickly talk about that? Um, yeah, why not? We'll get in, we'll introduce you in a moment, but why not quickly? What are you, what are you hiring for? Sure. Sure. Our, our team at the South China Morning Post, specifically the strategy and special projects team, we're looking to hire someone to join our team. Um, what the strategy and special projects team does is essentially work with the senior leaders across the South China Morning Post organization across, you know, high impact projects, whether it's, you know, thinking about new products to launch, how to enter into new markets, how to form strategic partnerships. Um, specifically in this case, uh, we're looking to bring on someone who will further accelerate um, SEMP Research, which is the newly launched business intelligence and research division of the South China Morning Post. So, you know, if this sounds interesting, you want to learn more, feel free to just hit me up on and LinkedIn. One, one question is, will they be yep. reporting to you? No, no, they would be working with me. Oh, good. Okay. So if they like you by the end of this interview, you're going to get hit on, right? If I was a little bit younger so. and you could afford me, I might, I might apply. But I, I like what you're doing. I like what media is doing. And I met, I met the uh, strategic team at South China Morning Post, and you're a smart bunch of people. I must say, very impressed. Um, thank you, thank you. So let's get back to it. I just want to thank Joey. He he has two titles. He is the lead author of of this report that you can see there. We're both co-branding. We've got a little China Internet report. It's under the South China Morning Post, but it's actually a new division, which Joey can tell us about in a moment, called SCMP Research, which I think is a smart move. And he's also the senior manager for strategy and special projects, which sounds really kind of you know, secret and Netflixy. So I'm sure you've got something going on there. You're in the media industry. You're doing, are you doing special projects for Jack Ma? Uh, not for Jack Ma, but we're doing special projects across the organization and media. Excellent. Good to know. So um, a year ago, I don't know if any of you saw this little post. I actually had the pleasure of interviewing Edith Young, who originally kind of instigated this whole China internet report um, as she was flying back and forth between Silicon Valley and China and was working for 500 startups. We had a great face to face, you know, in a nightclub in, in Central. We had a, it was supposed to be 60 minutes, went on for 90. The problem about, that I find about the internet in China is like talking about the history of China. You know, it's kind of five year, 5,000 years all squeezed into 123 pages. It's, it's a bit scary. So today we will try and cover as much as we can without getting too lost in statistics. What we'd like to do today is because if you've looked at the report, uh, there's the kind of light version, which is for free, and there's the pro version. Uh, the pro version has uh, what, 130 pages or so. It goes into 10 industries in depth. And then you do these live interviews with the six CEOs, right? Which I'm looking forward to. And you've got the community thing going on. So good, good packaging there. Good strategic thinking. So um, please sign up for that. You will note somewhere there's a code. Am I there? There's a discount code. Can you see it? There, there. And you get 30% off. That's a whacking 120 US dollars. So. Please do download it. It's really solid and really worth it. Um, so let's get into it, Joey. You, you come from the consulting business originally, right? Outside of, what is it, McKinsey or Accenture or? Yes, that is correct. Um, I came from McKinsey uh, based out in Taipei. And so I actually worked with 
um, mostly multinational companies, primarily in the TMT sector, so telecom media uh, technology, um, across greater China. So most of the clients were based in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. And how did you how did you get involved? I'm just curious. How did you land the job at SCMP, and how did you end up in looking after the the internet report? Because that's quite an unusual kind of role, right? Because you obviously the South China Morning Post has a big tech team that cover tech. You've got all kinds of podcasts. We've done an interview with uh, your guys about the products that you launched, Malcolm. I think it's Malcolm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, Malcolm, our uh, um, head yeah. of product. And you've got um, all yeah. kinds of products out there, which is interesting, from Inkstone to all kinds of stuff. So yeah. tell us how the SCMP research came up. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I'll talk very briefly about my journey. Um, I'm originally from New York, um, but I ended up in Hong Kong because my my now wife is from Hong Kong. So I came over, Congrats. and then I was thank you, thank you. I'm fortunate enough to um, you know find the South China Morning Post team. Um, work with uh, several fantastic colleagues, of course, Gary Liu, our CEO. And so the, the impetus for SCMP research really came um, out of, you know, what we identified as a need to be able to provide better business intelligence on, you know, key industry verticals within China. And so the key industry verticals we identified were, of course, one, the broader, you know, internet landscape, but then also on artificial intelligence, on healthcare and also fintech and you know financial technology, and so as part of SCM pre research, um, you know we we have you know several reports, um, and you know in addition to the reports we have you know exclusive access to these you know discussions and closed door webinars with executives, and so the China Internet Report is you know one of these uh, products that we've launched. So and very how happy. Find, to how do you, how do you find people are, are kind of taking to the idea of? a news, a venerated news organization moving into the kind of research report world. Is that, so is that I going think, well? Yeah, I think it's going quite well so far. Um, there is definitely a demand from, you know, um, uh, corporate professionals, you know, corporate companies, investors, um, you know, across the board, primarily still in, in Hong Kong and the United States. But generally there's, um, you know, quite, quite a positive demand for, for this sort of business intelligence that we're able to provide, as well as, you know, the access to the community, um, access to the, you know, uh, senior executives at these leading Chinese tech companies and, you know, across industries. So, so far things have been going quite well. And, you know, SCMP research is relatively new. We, we launched earlier this year in 2020. And so there's uh, quite room for growth. Okay. So let, let's, um, let's look at the actual report. Now I know I didn't, you know, this is more of a chat, so we didn't really want to put a PowerPoint in front of people because we'll scare them. But uh, one thing I did notice that uh, obviously you've got the benefit of having a good graphics team. So um, just let people know where they can down. I mean, I've sent hundreds of emails and social media links, all this kind of stuff. Maybe you can paste it to the, to the group uh, just where they can download the report. Um, right, there's a light version, I guess you're calling it, the free version which is what, 2030 kind of high level statistics, and then you've got the pro version, right? So, yes. I mean, one of the things that always fascinates me about, about anything to do with the internet in China, and it's funny when you're talking to startups, which I do a lot, obviously, uh, working with them, trying to sell their services to large corporates, is that the numbers are always massive, right? And they're just getting, keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So maybe we can just get those numbers out of the way. And then what I'd like to do with you is kind of drilled down into what people are actually doing. Because one of the things we find ourselves doing in Hong Kong is we, we kind of know what's going on in the internet in China, but we don't always participate in it. Especially now that we're not traveling into China, kind of we get a, you know, we get a filtered version, right? I know I have the Chinese WeChat and that gives me access and I have, you know, two Alipays, I have the Hong Kong Alipay, I have the, the China Alipay and, you know, there's all, and I've got Tabao and Tmall Express. I mean, we're, we're all, uh, we're all of two personalities in Hong Kong, right? We're split identity, I guess. Uh, no political reference there. Um, so one of the things, maybe just talk, quickly get some numbers out of the way, but one of the things that shocked me is that, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, is that, you know, I've been in the internet for 20 years. We all used to look up to the US as kind of, you know, the pioneer, the launcher of new services. Along came Facebook. You know, we were going 20,000 people in Hong Kong to everybody. Along came, I don't know, Flickr, that just bit quickly. Along came Instagram. You know, all these things come along. And now it's kind of interesting because 
we're starting to more point our interest at China and what are the innovations coming out of there, especially in terms of e-commerce. But some of the numbers that I see here that shock me is that what, what I've got here, like there's three times as many internet users in China as there are population of the US, right? That's, that's yeah, a bit shocking. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, the numbers are, you know, definitely there. They're massive. They tell quite a story. So China is, you know, unsurprisingly the largest internet community in the world. Like Napoleon mentioned, um, we've got 904 million internet users in China. You know, this is three times the, the population of the U.S. But, you know, if you think about it from another angle, 904 million internet users in China, you know, which is a population of 1.4 billion, that's only about, you know, 60% internet penetration which means there's probably another, you know, four to 500 million, you know, people in China who have not, you know, fully activated or, you know, leveraged the internet. And so the, the opportunities and the growth potentials are, are truly massive. When we, you know, do a comparison with the, the US, the, the US has already, you know, fully saturated or almost fully saturated its inter internet penetration, you know, 90, 90 plus percent of Americans are on the internet. But if you, you know, go further steps down in the internet and you look at actual, you know, mobile payments as one component mm. of the internet, you know, it's, it's a completely different story. In, in the US, you know, only 20 somewhat percent of Americans are using mobile payments. They're using, you know, PayPal or, or Venmo. But then in China, the story is completely the opposite. You've got over half of the entire Chinese population. So this is nearly 800 you know, million users who are actively using mobile payments. You know, this is your Alipay, your, your WeChat Pay, your, your QQ wallet. So, you know, the, the, the juxtaposition is quite- Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I had the pleasure of working for the American company. I used to fly over there and you know, everything, was, everything was cash, which was very strange. Uh, and in China, you know, I, I was a student there back in the late eighties. And, you know, we'd have wads of cash or a mid-B when we'd go and buy stuff. And it was all filthy, as in literally dirty money, not, not, not dirty, dirty, but dirty money. And um, it was very, you know, I can see why people would quickly jump across. What do you think is the driver uh, behind that? So for the, the, the story with, with China in, in terms of, you know, uh, payments and, and finance is they essentially kind of leapfrogged, you know, going from cash, you know, and then essentially <clears throat> skipping over, you know, that intermediary point of, you know, credit credit cards, et cetera, and then jumping directly into, you know, cashless payments and becoming a cashless payment society. And, and a large part of that is really driven by, you know, the innovations behind some of these leading companies, you know, specifically uh, Alibaba or, or Ant Group, and then also Tencent, being able to provide the technology that essentially facilitates, you know, this need for, you know, you know, payments between individuals, between companies and small businesses. And so because of this, you know, massive population, this massive need, being facilitated by these technologies for, you know, you know, cashless transactions, China was essentially able to kind of leapfrog over that, you know, second step and just, you know, really, really, you know, become a truly, you know, cashless society. And don't you think that's also because there's kind of, there's not so many players, so it's easier to roll this out. Because what I find in places like even Hong Kong or, or Britain or the US is there are many, many players. So there's always a battle for for the technology, yeah. which then makes it even more confusing for the end user, because when you walk into a convenience store or a shop, you, you know, you, you don't know which one to use, right? Whereas the, in, in China, yeah. it seems to be kind of like oligopoly, right? You just walk in, is it, is it Zufu Bao or is it, you know, what's the other Yeah, one? you're exactly right. right. The, the latest figure is that, you know, I've seen in China when it comes to mobile payments, it's essentially Alibaba and Tencent, you know, with those three products, Alipay, WeChat Pay and QQ Wallet. These three take up probably, you know, over 90% of the entire, you know, market share for, for mobile payments. So it's essentially, you know, there, there, there's no space for other players and other competitors to essentially compete. It's just, you know, Alibaba and Tencent. And what surprises me, I mean, you were mentioning some, going back to some of the numbers, they're, they're looking at a report here. What is it? 163 million users in the States of payments. And then the China's 12 times that, right? 765 million. So... How come the, the Chinese banks haven't got in on this? Because, I mean, what we're seeing here in Hong Kong is a, is a kind of evolution of banking. You know, they've suddenly woken up and this whole fintech drive has meant that they all want to get into, they've got these, you know, licenses now, for virtual banks for stored value payments. How come we're not seeing the big banks in China 
getting in on the game. I mean, although I could argue that um, with two full bar Alipay, you're actually linking to your bank account. So I suppose they're facilitating the bank. But do you see any, any of the big kind of incumbents getting in on this? Yeah, so that's a really good point. And, you know, my, my kind of perspective on this is, is right now, when it comes to mobile payments, you know, cashless transactions, it's really just going to continue to be this, you know, duopoly between Alibaba and Tencent. Um, but uh, it's interesting when we, you know, talk about these big banks and also the, the governments, you know, what, what, what could potentially be the next phase for, you know, payments and, you know, financial transactions in China. And then, you know, I don't want to get into too many buzzwords, but it then goes down the road of, you know, you know, blockchain or potentially even, you know, uh, digital currencies. And actually, this is something that, you know, the Central Bank of China also, you know, with some of the, the leading, you know, fintech players, they're putting together this whole thing about creating a sovereign digital currency for China. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this is still early in the works. They're running a couple of experiments, I believe, in, you know, several, um, in several key cities in China. Um, but I feel like this is something we should definitely be on the lookout for. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the, the kind of renminbi, you know, renminbi freedom is an interesting one, the, the digital currency. Again, it's having a centralized government, which makes it very, very interesting. Getting back to, um, I mean, you know, we're, we're in a world now where the payment thing, I mean, I've always been frustrated by e-commerce because payments has always been, you know, a nightmare. But what we're seeing in China is that, you know, it's, they've taken on the one click to pay thing, which I think is great. And we're, you know, this city is about to get a boost because Jack Ma is bringing yet another one of his businesses here. Right? I, like the, I like the fact it's got such a t- small name, but such a huge potential. Yima, right? The, Jima, what is it, Yima? the Ant Financial, right? Yeah. So having that come along is, is going to be a, an interesting boost. But let's get back to, I mean, I want to look at, you know, the last, since January, China, you know, was in lockdown first. And I had friends who were locked up, you know, six, six weeks, two months. Where did you see in, in this report, when did you start it? When did you finish it? Because I, I guess it, does it, has it taken into account the kind of effects of COVID on boosting businesses or changing business models, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. And so when we authored this report, it was actually, you know, during, you know, I wouldn't say the peak, but essentially the period of COVID. And one of the, you know, number one trends that we've identified in this report is essentially the lasting impact that COVID-19, you know, will have on the technology sector. And so um, there, there are a couple of ways to, to kind of look at this. So firstly is COVID has, you know, essentially transformed both consumer and, you know, business behavior across, you know, many different ways. And I'll throw out a couple of different figures. So pre, pre-COVID, um, you know, Chinese uh, citizens were essentially spending about five hours a day online. And then, you know, once the pandemic hit that, that number essentially spiked up to seven hours a day. And then similarly, when we're looking at, you know, the average number of apps they use in, you know, a given month, you know, pre-COVID that number was around 20. And then during COVID that number spiked up to 25. And so the single, you know, the, the, car- the category that saw the single biggest increase in users was essentially work productivity and, you know, enterprise communications apps. You know, these saw a massive surge of 300 million users. And so we're, we're all familiar with these enterprise communication apps. You know, we're, we're currently using Zoom right now, maybe at work you're you know, on Microsoft Teams or um, Google um, suite of products or even Slack. But in China, you know, they have their own ecosystem and you know, products, specifically their DingTalk, WeChat Work and Tencent Meeting. So these three products are also by Alibaba and Tencent. And so in terms of like um, the, the working habits because of COVID, you know, everyone has essentially gone virtual and are you know, heavy, heavily leveraging these enterprise communication apps. So you're so seeing, yeah, ding, ding talk. Yeah, so the, that's interesting. So the work, the work from home has given a big push to Tencent Meeting. I tried a few uh, calls uh, through Tencent Meeting on WeChat. It was quite convenient to set up, but a bit frustrating if you're not on WeChat, right? It's kind of, it's always the walled garden, right? It's very easy yeah. to scan a QR code and join actually kind of easier than Zoom really, but it doesn't have all the functionality for recording and all that waiting room kind of stuff. So it was interesting to see how quickly they've adapted. But in terms of the, that now, I guess you're not tracking that yet, but I guess that would be interesting to see how, how that spike has, is it leveled out or is it, is it, you know, is it petered out? Or as, Cause obviously in China, life seems to have gone pretty back, pretty well back to normal, right? 
Yeah, well, the, the latest figures I've seen, um, so the, the number of you know, users, monthly active users across you know, Ding Talk, WeChat Work, Tencent Meeting, um, they're definitely much higher than the pre-COVID numbers, but of course it's, it's dipped since the, the peak. So I think you know, COVID, even though you know, um, the, the pandemic seems to has you know, finished its, its worst in, in China, um, the, the behavior of consumers and you know, businesses have still been you know, affected and there will be you know, longer term impact of this. So from a, from a work from home scenario, I mean, you know, we live in a pretty crowded, dense city and we, the, we were talking about this earlier, you know, as soon as offices open up, there's a mad, mad rush to get back into the office, right? We don't have the space to kind of hide ourselves from our children at the end of the garden or up a tree or whatever. Um, so how do you see this? How does it work from home? I mean, you, you've talked about the communication part of it for businesses. How are you seeing it also changing? How are the habits changed in terms of, let's start with maybe education, right? You've got, I mean, China, you know, Chinese have always been, I'm married to a Chinese lady, always very focused on education. Uh, and it's a huge country, obviously. So how how is that changed at all? I, I mean, here outside of China, you know, it's, it's the zoomification of education, right? And we're all, all our kids are uh, sitting in front of laptops trying to learn. So how is that a parlayed in China? Yeah, the education space, you know, and also online education within China has, you know, seen drastic, you know, adoption and, and, and growth and, you know, a lot of new innovations are happening here. So, you know, because of, of, of course, because of COVID, you know, um, Chinese, you know, parents and students essentially had to, you know, shift education online. And, you know, I believe, you know, some of the figures show that like as many as 50 million students had to attend classes on, on Ding Talk, you know, you know, the virtual platform on the, you know. And Ding Talk is owned by Alibaba, right? Ding Talk, Ding Talk is, is the, also, yes, Ding Talk is an yeah. Alibaba product. Because I know they have another product called Lai Wang, which is their kind of Taobao chat product, right? But I yes. guess they're learning from that to start Ding Talk. Mm. But I think one of the key things we should remember is that virtual learning and, you know, virtual classrooms already existed in China pre-COVID, and it was actually already, you know, readily adopted. So you had companies like, let's say, VIP Kid, you know, which is yeah. one of the leading, you know, education companies in China, best known for teaching English to students. Um, they were one of the early pioneers of the online classroom where they were able to connect English teachers and let's say the United States to Chinese students in Beijing or you know, even rural areas. And so pre-COVID, the, the idea of you know, virtual learning, virtual classes, this was you know, much more readily adopted in China than let's say the, the United States. And you know, some, some of the figures to support this um, from I believe 2017 to 2019, the, the number of online education users in China, you know, grew, grew steadily. Um, it, it wasn't a, a massive growth, but there was continuous growth. But you know, in 2019, we're essentially seeing about 260 million online education users. And because of COVID, by the end of this year, we think that in China, online education users, you know, will surge up to 420 million. So this is essentially a 60% increase. And are you seeing this mostly, is it like in the States now, they're, they're struggling with going back to school, right? Going back to college. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just seen my son off to the States actually, but they've just, they're going back to, you know, going back to college, it's all being, uh, basically a lot of the colleges are, are being shut down, right? Is yeah. what's happening in China? I mean, when you say this online learning, is it, and like VIP kids is very much in that kind of primary, secondary school thing. What's happening in China? Is it, is it very much tertiary as well? Or is it the kind of, you know, primary, secondary side of things? Do you know the breakdown between that? I don't necessarily have the breakdown, but, you know, we're, when we look at, you know, you know, preschool education and K through 12, and then you have, I guess, also language learning or also vocational. I think for across the board, um, we're now seeing a combination of essentially, you know, traditional teaching methods and curriculums, but also a combination of, you know, online learning or new formats of, of learning. So essentially the, the curriculum has been sort of revamped to combine both traditional means and then also new online tools and, you know, classrooms essentially create a, a, a new era of education, you can call it. And has the live streaming, you know, live streaming has obviously been going in China for a year or two now or a bit longer, but has that, 
also, yeah, I can see education is, is, you know, a pure form of live streaming, right? You don't tell to send, send, you don't tend to sell things during it. Well, maybe, you know, brain enhancement, but it's interesting as you, as that live streaming, I guess education is about live, right? It's people interacting, it's, it's the yeah. live. Do you see, is it the same thing? I mean, I know there's a lot of small education websites in China where like uh, Zuhu, right? Where you can pay to kind of appreciate people's knowledge. Right, a bit like the kind of Chinese Wikipedia, but the difference is, or Quora, right? The Chinese the Quora in China, but people actually gift. So I think we can get to that later, the whole kind of money side of it, because I think that's quite interesting. But staying with the work from home, we've talked about the kind of the messaging, we've talked about the education side. What about the, um, you know, we're talking about children. What about making babies? I'm curious about the making babies side of things, because uh, I have a few of those. and. Um, you know, the dating, the dating side of things seems to be, you know, a big thing on the internet in China. I mean, everybody I know is on Douyin, uh, you know, it seems to be leaning towards, you know, flirting. So I'm sure your, and your report has covered this, is the, you know, the love side of the internet. Where do you see, I mean, you know, where do you see that uh, changing or what, what data do you have to, to reveal anything behind that for us? Yeah, happy to talk a little bit more about the, the dating and, you know, uh, love landscape in China. And I do have to dis have a disclaimer and say, you know, my research is purely secondary. You know, I am happily married. So <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, yeah, I, unable I was to, about to say you're happily married, <laughs> right? Okay. Good. I was unable to, you know, go on these multitude of dating apps um, and kind of trial them. But, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. When we look at, um, you know, the dating technology in, in China. It's, it's certainly, you know, followed on some of the best practices from, from the US. And so when you look at the, the landscape in China, um, you have both, you know, the, the longstanding, you know, dating platforms and applications, as well as uh, a, a number of many new, new startups. So like, like you mentioned, uh, Momo and Tan Tan, these are yeah. essentially the, the Chinese equivalents of Tinder. And, you know, they, they've been around for quite a number of years. Um, and, and the fact is in, in China, um, using dating apps is much more readily accepted you know, by society, especially you know, among um, the, the, the Gen Z and millennial you know, user segments. I'm quite surprised so, when you say that because I've always thought, I mean, particularly maybe it's a Hong Kong thing, people are much more conservative in Hong Kong than they are across the border, right? So you're saying it's quite acceptable for people so, to be finding partners through these apps? I would say it's more acceptable. It's not yeah. reached a point where it's you know fully accepted by every member of society, but compared with you know five years ago, it's definitely much more accepted. And so the the key thing with you know these you know dating apps is an introduction of you know new features, specifically regarding you know video or you know live streaming functions. And this is something that's you know differentiated from from other markets. And during COVID, you know because no one can go out and grab someone for coffee or go to the movie theater or whatever, you know, everything has to be done um, virtually. And so I'll, I'll bring up one existing example that I looked into. Um, and I, I believe the company was called uh, Mauhu. Uh, it's one of the new dating um, platforms or social apps that was launched by Tencent. And it definitely incorporates a video feature. So from my understanding is if, you know, a couple is matched up, um, they can essentially enter into a video chat room. But what's interesting is that there is a mask or filter function. So for example, you know, I'm talking to you, Napoleon, but my face would essentially be covered by, let's say a cartoon of a cat or whatever. Oh, interesting. So yeah. we wouldn't actually be able to see each other's face. For, for the male, um, they're able to keep this feature for five minutes, but after that, their face would be revealed. But for the, the woman, they can keep this mask indefinitely. So I thought that was a little interesting. And does the man, does the man have to pay more in order to keep his face masked? Is that the idea? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think it's, it's the, the rule is set. You can only cover your face for five minutes. After that, you must reveal yeah, I think that's good. To, there are a lot of, I mean, in the West, there's a lot of apps launched by women which give more power to the women. So that's an interesting trend. And then moving on swiftly to um, food. I mean, you know, we're all stuck at home. Uh, China, like Hong Kong, is famous for having little stores and you know, little, little trolleys and things all over every city you go to, food is 
always available, 24 hours a day, uh, down in alleyways with bowls of noodles and stuff. Um, how do you see that, that, that whole, I mean, we obviously know Alamo has been around for a while and Miguan has been around for a while and stuff like that. So how is that, how have you seen that evolve? What are the numbers and the kind of statistics or maybe interesting stories you see behind that? So with regards to food delivery, uh, like you said, you know, the Alamaz, the Meituan Jinpings, they've been around for a quite number of, uh, of years. But at the same time, these are the key players that have essentially owned the entire market, market space. So their, their market share is massive and they're just continuously competing with each other, you know, looking for white spaces, whether it's, you know, maybe in third or fourth tier cities or, you know, targeting specific segments, you know, subsidizing you know, restaurant prices. And so I think uh, my, my own perspective is um, when we look at food delivery in China, the space will continue continuously uh, be dominated by these existing players just because they've already established, you know, their necessary infrastructure of, you know, restaurants and riders and, you know, delivery people, um, you know, coming up with, you know, specific uh, discounts or perks and essentially having this network that can, you know, make sure delivery times are, are low and, you know, the customer experience is optimal. So I think these major players have really just, you know, um, crushed the game and have like fully optimized. And essentially at this point, they're just competing directly with one another to surpass each other. And what, what's always amazed me about these kind of guys in, in China is that, they, you know, it's about logistics and it's about keeping your costs low. And obviously in China, the readily available people on bicycles and motorbikes to, to drive across the city and deliver stuff. And I, I guess you don't have the issues that come up in the States with Uber around unionization or, you know, are these people employees or not employees? Does this kind of stuff come up or not really? Not that I'm aware of. And, you know, talking about the you know, user experience, I, I've been able to, you know, experience Uber Eats, Deliveroo, both here in Hong Kong, as well as, you know, in, in New York and in the States, as well as, you know, during my visits to uh, Beijing or Shanghai or the metropolitan cities in, in uh, China and leveraging Meituan Jinping or Ulame. And I'm always constantly impressed when I'm in China by the efficiency, the, the quality of, you know, the ordering process and the delivery process. And th this is actually one of the, you know, main reasons why I'm so excited to go, go visit China um, and essentially, you know, order some of my favorite foods through these services. I bet you that's not the first thing you're gonna do. You're not gonna lock yourself up in a hotel room after being in Hong Kong. You'll be out there partying or doing research in restaurants. <laughs> Um, that's interesting. And I also see what, what I've seen from uh, China, which is interesting, is the food delivery is also changing. You know, it's, it starts off in pre-cooked, you know, arrives at your door, the noodles are a bit soggy, the soup's got a bit warm, you know, lukewarm, uh, but you're getting it kind of pre-cooked. I, I understand now there's a trend because people are spending more time at home, they're getting more interested in cooking and their health. It's all, I suppose it comes full circle, is the idea of having kind of pre-prepared food delivered to you and you, you do the finishing touches, right? Is that, that I see that's in your report, but is that an interesting, you see that as a growing area? I mean, there's a convenience obviously of having something delivered already cooked because you don't have to clean anything. The only problem is it produces all kinds of crap that goes into the environment. But uh, I'm interested to see, you know, this kind of pre-prepared uh, delivery culture that's starting. I'm sure it's a small, small, small part of the, the community, but it's interesting to hear more about it. Yeah, so, you know, in, in this aspect around, let's say, you know, uh, fresh foods or, or pre-prepared foods or, you know, high quality foods, um, this is definitely a growing space um, within, you know, let's just say the, the broader, you know, e-commerce space uh, in China. And so China's grocery, you know, landscape is essentially also dominated by just a couple of few players. These are, you know, the large leading uh, technology and internet companies like uh, Meituan Jianping, like even your Alibaba and your Tencent. And you know, these, these companies are present across um, many different verticals for food, including you know, your supermarkets, your hypermarkets, your, your convenience stores, or even you know, your fresh food markets. And so these companies have either launched their own products and brands or have formed strategic partnerships with you know, existing uh, service providers. And so there, there's a, a massive you know, offering 
know, if, if I'm a consumer and I want to order a, a fresh food or a grocery or, you know, whatever, I'm able to do so, you know, quite efficiently just, you know, based on my location. And, you know, these different service providers will be able to cater to almost every single need that I have. And what is, what is the consumer promise in terms of delivery when it comes to these, these groceries and stuff? I mean, you know, Hong Kong, we order HKTV Mall, and they only deliver I don't know, two, three days later. Uh, Park and Shop, you know, here, you know, such a tiny place and the delivery promise is ridiculous. So uh, what, what do you see in, uh, you know, when it comes to food and the, 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 you said the groceries are getting on board now, right? I understand yeah, because yeah. of COVID across the world, it's the grocers who basically managed to stay alive. You know, in, in Hong Kong, the government feels they have to support them because the poor grocers are making too much money. But what, what, is, what is the situation in terms of the, the, you know, the consumer promise? Because this is one thing that, in a particular in North America, they're very proud of, we understand the consumer. But I think China has really hit the nail on the head when it comes to making a promise to a consumer and delivering yeah, that promise. Absolutely. And I think one of the most important you know, consumer promises that these you know, fresh food delivery services provide is, is, is guaranteed delivery time, you know, with, with some you know, caveats based on where you live. But if you're living in one of the large, you know, first tier cities, essentially they'll promise you delivery within, you can say 30 minutes of ordering. This is just, you know, one example from let's mm. say an Alibaba you know, Huma uh, superstore. And, and for the vast majority of times, they will absolutely, you know, keep to that promise of really quick, efficient delivery. And also of course, the, the food quality is very high. But another thing that um, China is also exploring is essentially autonomous delivery. And so, you know, the whole autonomous vehicle development thing is really kicking off and, you know, uh, accelerating in China. And one of the components is autonomous delivery, which has been applied to uh, food delivery, specifically mm -hmm. during COVID. There have been a couple of use cases um, where you know, a couple of cities have trialed autonomous delivery um, so that, you know, the delivery of you know fresh goods and food is you know contactless and so it minimizes you know uh transmission of covid so this is also one very interesting thing that we're seeing in china well, and how is this working how they deliver where do they deliver they deliver it to your door or is it dropped in front of at the guard post i mean a lot of a lot of developments in china high rise have a you know little old man or woman who is kind of are there to receive you or let people in and out is that where it's being delivered to yeah unfortunately um it can't be you know door to door um, in yeah. some of these use cases, it's essentially uh, a delivery to a certain destination point or a rendezvous point. And then from there, it would be a drop off and you would still have to go manually pick it up. But it's still a, a massive improvement. And do you see, I mean, this is, you know, this is quite advanced. Do you see other markets? I know you're not across a lot of markets, but being from New York yourself, do you see, you know, it used to be the C to C, right? Copy to China. Now it's, I, I don't know what you call it, uh, copy to America, maybe C to A or, or, you know, the Americans don't copy stuff apparently, but, um, you know, uh, what's the word, innovate to America. So do you see that, that flow happening the other way, especially in this kind of food, you know, we talked about the work from home stuff. Have you seen any of this overflow being picked up by the, the US or European Markets. Yeah, I, I think it's also happening in the U.S. So I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, one is copying the other, but we can say that, you know, they're both innovating in parallel. So yeah. in China, so we have... so diplomatic. <laughs> people would be very happy about that comment. Yeah, Muriel, did I answer that okay? <laughs> no, but, but in all seriousness, like the, the, the China example, I, I remember now it's, it's Mei Tuan. Um, yeah. you know, they, they tested this, uh, I believe, in, in like the, the outskirts of, of Beijing. And so they were able to test the electric delivery robot um, with, you know, certain uh, capacity of, of, you know, maybe 100 kilograms and, you know, they deliver it to certain um, specified areas. But uh, similarly on the U.S., uh, one of the, you know, uh, leading companies, which is Pony.ai, which is, you know, headquartered yeah. both in the U.S. and China, um, they launched a self-delivering, uh, self driving delivery service, I believe it was in California. And so this was also during the, the COVID lockdown. And so I think during this trial period, um, they partnered with one of the uh, local uh, e-commerce platforms. And so residents in this, you know, California, Irvine, LA area were essentially able to, you know, order goods and have it delivered in a contactless way. And so this was a, a small trial period, maybe, you know, maybe a dozen of these, you know, test vehicles. 
but you know, it was still definitely um, an innovation and experiment that uh, happened in the US. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole different subject, the kind of the transferring this stuff across to the US. But getting back to maybe the, the kind of thing that most people seem to spend their time doing on the internet when they're at home is shopping. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, obviously, uh, when I lived in China, you had to go to the friendship store and use your white way to, and, uh, to, to buy, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever it was many years ago. But the shopping has really, really, you know, really, and it's all through mobile, obviously, the numbers you shared earlier, what was it, 76 million users or what, 763 million, whatever the number was, it was huge, right, the mobile users. But um, it's interesting, the shopping trends, I mean, Maybe talk to us a little bit more about that. I mean, we see, you know, we know, I mean, we know about Taobao, we know about VIP shop, we know about, I mean, I know a lot about the fashion kind of textile world, but obviously you mentioned groceries earlier on, but shopping, how is that, how is that, you know, changing and being led by China? Yeah, shopping is a big one, shopping and e-commerce. And so I think when we talk about shopping and e-commerce, um, they're kind of, two key areas that I want to focus on. The first one is live streaming, live streaming yeah. as a channel for shopping and e-commerce. And then the second one, um, which I'll get to later, is around uh, social e-commerce. So specifically around live streaming, um, it, it's good to think about live streaming in, you know, in the context of its history and its evolution. In China, live streaming essentially kicked off you know, in the early 2010s, 2012s. And it was really focused on specific content subjects like, you know, gaming and sports and mm -hmm. teen culture. And at that point, it was still the early stages of live streaming. Um, a lot of different platforms were essentially um, experimenting, launching, trying to get as much eyeballs as possible. So that was sort of the first phase. Then you have the second phase of live streaming in China, which is actually quite recent. Um, let's just say it's between 2017 and 2019. Here, live streaming really kicked off. Um, as a e-commerce channel, but specifically for you know, uh, fast moving consumer goods like beauty products. And so it was this period that gave rise to a lot of KOLs or key opinion leaders in China. Right now, probably the most famous person that um, some of us might know is essentially Li Jiaqi. He's known as the lipstick king. Yeah, so what happened to your lipstick? I'm not impressed. You're, you're, you should dress up for the event. Talk to your PR people. I'm, I'm not impressed. Sorry, Get sorry. I'll, it, man. BTS, I'll take the, you're take a young guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, this, this KOL, Li Jiaqi, is arguably the most famous KOL in China because, you know, every day he's live streaming for hours and he's trialing lipsticks and his audience is predominantly women. And, you know, He'll, he'll live stream for let's say one or two hours and be able to essentially drive, you know, millions and millions of dollars of products in sales. And so, you know, the, the second phase really exploded for, for e-commerce around, you know, these, you know, beauty products and, and KOLs. And now I think we're sort of in this third phase of, of live streaming where live streaming as an e-commerce channel is no longer just relevant to you know, beauty products or fast moving consumer goods, but it's actually, relevant and a necessary uh, e-commerce sales channel for all industries, especially traditional industries. Live streaming is an important factor um, and you know, all the companies have realized that it's really good for driving sales, creating customer retention and engagement. And so for example, you'll have you know, automotive companies, you know, traditional industry where you know, back in the day you, or, or still in the day you go to a car dealer shop and you, know, you talk to a salesperson and you know, test drive a car. But now a lot of these dealers are leveraging e uh, live streaming to have their agents, you know, do walkthroughs of their vehicles and sell these vehicles through live streaming. Same thing with real estate. Now you have tons of uh, real estate agents doing, you know, virtual walkthroughs of residential spaces, commercial office spaces. Likewise with, you know, agriculture. Now we're seeing tons of, you know, farmers and folks in rural areas becoming KOLs because people are interested in seeing how you know the foods they eat actually are harvested from the crops and understanding the, the entire value yeah the, those are my favorite I, i've watched a few of those those are my favorite you know they're there in their wellington boots and they're pulling up onions or potatoes or whatever it is and they talk about them with so much passion it's uh, it's quite interesting because it kind of feeds into that you know natural back to nature kind of wellness thing that seems to be going on in china because all these health scares which which is yeah. interesting but the live streaming one i, I wanted to ask you i mean 
the live streaming, you mentioned real estate. I mean, there are cases in your report of people selling, you've said cars, uh, some, apparently some lady sold a rocket. I don't quite understand how that works, but she sold a yeah. rocket. I don't know if that means a journey on a rocket or, or you know, you get your own private rocket. I'm not, not quite sure how that works. And then also C-Trip, the, uh, the CEO of C-Trip is up there, you know, selling. It's quite interesting. So the, what, what, I, what I'm curious is that it's almost like the, um, you know, the celebrity culture, you'll appreciate this, that exists in the States, which unfortunately brought the current president into power. But that celebrity culture seems to be growing in China where the, the business leader, he or she, becomes a, a kind of, not just a, a leader in that business, but a spokesperson and now a revenue generator through live streaming. So it's, it's, it's an interesting direction this is taking. Do you see this happening in kind of more state industries like insurance or, or things like that? So we've seen this happen um, so far, primarily around, let's say travel and technology, and you know, technology products. But I certainly see, you know, this expanding further into other, let's say, you know, traditional industries. And so you brought up the example of, you know, James Lang, the CEO and chairman of C-Trip selling, you know, travel products. Um, in the report, we also mentioned that um, Gri Electric Appliances, you know, a chairwoman, she's also known as, you know, the, the, the queen of, you know, appliances in China. She was also, you know, uh, up in camera on, on, on live streaming uh, channels and essentially selling millions and millions of dollars of product. Um, I mean, even before them, we had Jack Ma uh, also doing live streaming where he was on a one-on-one -on -one against Li Jiaqi to see who could sell more lipsticks you know, <laughs> in, 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 a, in, a, in a given time period. Li, Li Jiaqi, of course, won, but it was very interesting to have you know, Jack Ma trialing you know, lipsticks. But I, you, only I say that, you only say that because he owns your company. I'm not too sure if I'd like to see Jack Ma trialing on lipsticks. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, but I, I completely agree with you about, you know, this uh, celebrity entrepreneur culture, you know, being the face of a product of a company and, you know, actually being the ones to drive these sales. Um, I think this will definitely continue um, for other companies and uh, be across other sectors. That is very interesting. And then talking about um, that, there's, a, there's an element here of your business, which is media, right? It's interesting because, um, you know, what you're saying is that all of these businesses, you know, whether they're selling electrical appliances or cars or insurance or lipstick, they're all becoming, you know, media players, right? I mean, Jack Ma was very inspirational in the fact that in the early days he saw that, you know, the double eleven was an opportunity to drive entertainment. You know, shopping has gone from being, you know, I'm going out to try on something or buy something to it becomes a whole entertainment there's a whole entertainment industry behind it, right? It makes the whole journey of shopping is, is entertainment. I mean, if you look at the Double Eleven Festival, it's, you know, he flies in international celebrities and they dance and sing. And so there's a whole entertainment world behind that. How do you see that affecting, you know, the media industry that you're in? Because obviously, you know, it's, you know, when, uh, and if you can't comment on this, don't worry. But, you know, when, when uh, I mean, we've seen, you know, Amazon, you know, acquire Washington Post, is it? Um, right, so big e-commerce operators acquiring news outlets. And the, the natural thing is to think, okay, they're either doing this because it's a plaything of, of the millionaire, the multi-billionaire, sorry, or it's a, a potential channel of content, content creation. If you look at my industry, the kind of marketing and the PR world, they're always, the last six years, seven years, is all about it being about content and how how do you take that content and monetize it? So how do you see that shaking up the media industry? Because I mean, China in many ways is, is really rethinking what media is from you know, entertainment. I mean, obviously news is, is a sensitive one, but just entertainment. Yeah, so I think it's a really good question and I'll try to address it in, in two parts. Um, firstly, the, the idea that you know, media and you know, commerce are you know completely separate? I don't think that's necessarily accurate, and we're we're seeing you know a convergence of media and commerce you know globally actually. And I'll talk about the U.S. specifically. So, for example, you have the New York Times, you know, a traditional uh, media company, but you know several years ago they acquired you know the Wirecutter, and you know the Wirecutter is a site where you know you go to to read product reviews you know across tech products about cooking products about whatever, 
And then essentially, you know, you read the reviews, you like the product, you click and you purchase it. And then it'll drive you to, let's say an Amazon or directly to the you know, product purchase page. And then the wire cutter will essentially, you know, get, you know, affiliate revenue or portion of that. So, you know, New York Times has already, you know, experimented and succeeded, you know, with this, you know, uh, content to commerce model. And then, you know, similarly, another uh, company like, like BuzzFeed, you know, BuzzFeed recently also just launched, you know, a designated BuzzFeed shopping portion. So mm -hmm. BuzzFeed, you know, has you know, tons of content. They have BuzzFeed news. Um, and now they're also experimenting with uh, essentially, you know, this is content to commerce. So I, I don't think media and e-commerce are necessarily separate. I think they, you know, could definitely complement each other. Um, in, in China, uh, I, I'm not seeing too much of this yet, um, but it's it's definitely you know a possibility that this can you know push forward. So I, I guess that would be my two cents on this. I guess in China it's much more event driven, right? I mean the whole e-commerce world, of putting live streaming aside, is very event driven. One of the frustrations I know with the the retailers and the kind of foreign brands I I, I work with who go into China is that they're very scared of doing any of this. Uh, you know, marketplace live streaming stuff because it's typically uh, discount driven, right? So it's quite, it's quite a scary experience, especially for the, the kind of more high tier brands to have to go in and everything's event driven, right? It's all related to, to special dates, whether it's double 11 or 611 or, you know, chocolate day, milk chocolate day, white chocolate day, Valentine day. You know, it just, every day has got something going on, right? So. Yeah, I, I think it's both event driven and also, you know, socially driven. So, you know, of, of course, when we talk about e-commerce in China, like everyone knows Taobao, Tmall. Um, but I, I think people should also know about the you know, other players specifically in the you know, social e-commerce space. So the best example here would be Pinduoduo. And you know, for the folks who don't know Pinduoduo, they are actually you know, uh, China's second you know, largest e-commerce player in terms of you know, uh, active users. And how they essentially you know, came to be so successful is that they kind of pioneered this model of group buying. So, you know, maybe I want to purchase this, you know, cooking item um, and it'll be set at whatever, let's say hundred RMB. But if I'm able to get nine other, my friends to purchase this, we can all get it for, let's say 60 RMB. And so they kind of pioneered this whole idea of group, uh, group buying. Um, and, and they've been super successful. They've kind of skyrocketed in terms of you know, their, their sales and, and users in just a couple of years. Uh, another example would be uh, Xiao Hongsu or, or Little Red Book. And the best way to sort of characterize this social e-commerce company would be to think about them as sort of a combination of Instagram, Pinterest, and Amazon. So if I open my Xiao Hongsu app, I'll see essentially kind of a board of you know all the different you know items that I could potentially be interested in, of course you know the AI algorithms would customize it to to my preferences. Um, it would be essentially you know browsing, um, and the the interesting thing about Xiao Hongshu is that their users are you know the majority female, sixty percent of them are from tier one and tier two cities, and then also uh, the majority of them are young millennials or, or Gen Xers. So they've essentially found their their niche of customers. It's interesting that you mentioned Pinduoduo because I mean, uh, when Groupon came first kind of broke out, there was, you know, in China within weeks, there was thousands of Groupon clones, right? But they, they were doing the, the group buying without the social element. And I guess the mobile element hadn't really kicked in. I think when, the, when you talk about Pinduoduo and all these other things, what seems to be fascinating is that they all burn, they're all born on mobile, right? And it's, and it's very socially driven. It's not the core Groupon where it's kind of group discount. There's also incentives for inviting your friends to join. You know, I mean, you get, I've, I've used these things and you, it, once you're in, it's, you're kind of hooked, right? Your, your whole diaspora is engaged, right? It's, it's almost like an insurance salesperson, right? You first sell to your family and then your cousins, it goes on and on and you run out of people to sell to. So quite interesting. I'm also curious about um, the B2B side of things um, because, uh, you know, we, we always talk, tend to talk, talk about the consumer side. And you mentioned AI and stuff like that. And, you know, there, there is interesting, you know, obviously there's a lot happening to support all of this behind the scenes. I mean, the, the logistics machine that is Tsainia or, or JD's, you know, logistics arms are, are incredible. And if you look at the, you know, you talked about AI as well, but the robots, it seems to me 
the kind of robotization seems to be really happening in that area is the logistics side. Although you still do see, you know, at double eleven, you still do see stacks of boxes of people walking around them as if it was rubbish piles, right? There, there's still human beings running around organizing these things. But maybe you could expand on that. And I'd, I'd like to transition to the B2B and maybe we've only got five minutes, so maybe we can extend, we can squeeze it out a little bit longer if you're open to it. But the idea of, you know, what, what's happening there in B2B, you know, starting with logistics. Yeah, so on, on transport and logistics, I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, innovation. Um, and a lot of it is also driven by the, you know, the emergence and surge of artificial intelligence. So, you know, when we look at the transport and logistic industries, you know, they're, they're largely driven by, you know, uh, economics like fuel mm -hmm. costs or you know, time to delivery or, you know, supply chain reliability. And so within transport and logistics, we're seeing a lot of, you know, new artificial intelligence use cases, like, of course, the, the development of our autonomous vehicles. Um, for you know delivery, but then it also expands into let's say you know traffic management or, or freight optimization, and so there are actually a lot of um, I won't say a lot, but there there are several Chinese startups that have really capitalized on you know uh, this 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 white space of leveraging AI to you know further optimize transport and logistics, and you know these are the companies that would essentially be serving the, the large Alibabas or, you know, the JDs or, or the Huawei's or, or whatever. And so one example is a company called, I believe, Neolix. And so I believe they are the first company globally, actually, to kick off the mass production of self-driving delivery vehicles. And I believe they've already you know, lined up um, a lot of sales with, you know, the, the leading uh, e-commerce companies. And so this is just one example. Um, like you mentioned, Napoleon, there are a lot more examples, you know, looking directly into transport and logistics to essentially facilitate this continued explosive growth in e-commerce and sales. And do you think, I mean, I, I personally think that that's going to be one of the areas that 5G is going to really kick in. You know, we, we tend to all uh, kind of foam at the mouth when we mention 5G and the consumer experience. But as you said, we're already, we're already live streaming. We're already, you know, already kind of listening to music, watching videos, we're all gaming live. Uh, it seems to me the 5G, you can contradict me if your research shows not, but that, that it seems to be the booster to the whole, you know, the smart city, the whole B2B thing, the ability for machines to talk to each other. Where, where do you see that going? I mean, I know you've got separate, I mean, 5G is a huge topic to itself, but that, that B2B side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 2020 is definitely the year of 5G for, for China. Um, you know, I won't get into the figures, but, you know, 5G subscribers are you know, exploding. The market is exploding. The infrastructure is, you know, almost fully in place. And you know, the government um, essential uh, uh, direction uh, of 5G development as a strategic priority. Um, you know, all these factors, you know, point towards, you know, 5G really becoming a reality. And, you know, specifically on the, you know, the, the to be component, um, we're seeing a lot of 5G use cases, uh, industrial use cases, you know, already in play. So, you know, transport and logistics, leveraging, you know, uh, AI and autonomous delivery, that's one component. But, you know, we can also look towards, you know, manufacturing and smart manufacturing. A lot of these uh, plants um, in China are really transitioning to become, you know, smart manufacturing facilities where you know, they're gradually going from you know, remote control robots or you know, uh, assembly lines or you know, production uh, facilities to semi-automatic and eventually to you know, fully autonomous operations. Uh, similarly, if we look at, let's say, agriculture, we're seeing a lot of examples of smart agriculture where you, know, you have um, intelligent greenhouses that offer, you know, the ideal temperature and humidity settings, you know, customized nutrition that's fed to plants, you know, 5G linked pest and disease control systems. So all of these, you know, um, together uh, are, are essentially facilitated by, by the development of 5G. It's interesting because a lot of these things you're, you're talking about, like the, you know, good old Si uh, Dagger's uh, positioning on making China self-reliant. I know it's not from a food perspective, but uh, what you just talked about using AI in these, in these kind of environments to help with the agriculture and food is an interesting space. Um, before we go to Q&A, uh, I hope, can you, can you handle another 15, 20 minutes? You're okay with that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that. What I'd like to do before we go to Q&A, just, you know, um, you're going to be sitting here, hopefully, and that, that last zero is going to turn to a one. And uh, give us some, like, you know, I want to see how good you are at having your finger on the pulse. Tell us what's going to be different when we sit and talk about this in 2021. Is it going to be, we're not going to be doing this on Zoom anymore? Or are we going to be kind of be sitting there with the holograms? Or are we going to go back, back a few steps? What, what's the, what's, I mean, China, you know, we're in Hong Kong, right? So we have, we have an, an interesting mixture here in Hong Kong because we basically stride both internets, right? We've got the China internet and, you know, the continuing balkanization of the American internet, I guess. Uh, the Western, the Western is not really the right term, but where do you see, you know, as a year from now, how's, how, are we just going to go back to all together and kumbaya or where is it all going to happen with the technology? That's a good question. And again, I wish I had a crystal ball, but my, my hope is, you know, you know, putting, putting geopolitics aside, the, the hope is that we, we don't continue down this, you know, path of two walled gardens and, you know, two complete different ecosystems and technology development. And hopefully there, there's more collaboration, which leads to more innovations across, you know, big data, AI, cloud computing, 5G, et cetera. But I think if we look towards, let's say 2021 and what we can talk about for, you know, the China internet and technology landscape, I think one of the, the key things will be around, you know, um, the whole industrial IOT internet of things and kind of the, the, the smart city explosion. So by, by 2021, when you know 5G is essentially you know fully mobilized or maximized, where you have the infrastructure in place, um, you know, and continuous developments across you know um, cloud computing by by the big players like you know Alibaba, etc., and then also continuous development of artificial intelligence across many different applications, you know, not just in security and facial recognition, but you know, in computer vision and you know things like you know medical imaging, you know, all of these will really come together. Um, specifically around, you know, the industrial use cases of, you know, um, the internet of things and, you know, um, smart city and essentially mobilizing um, the, the Chinese masses across, you know, different cities, not just in tier one cities or tier two cities, but also, you know, the rural areas. And I think that's where we'll see a lot of interesting things happen. Actually, you mentioned one thing I forgot to ask you, which was the, the whole medical side of things, which is an, an interesting one, right? I mean, remote medicine, we're starting to push that here in Hong Kong, but the idea of, you know, obviously China has been covered by the media about, you know, having these QR codes that say if you're, you know, green, red, or, or, or black, whatever, get the hell out of here. So um, it's interesting, uh, you know, interesting to see uh, what's happening there. I mean, maybe before we jump to Q&A, maybe give us a little filler on, on the, the medicine side of things, because there's a lot of, obviously COVID has pushed it across the whole world. Uh, from tracking to actual, you know, uh, consultations with doctors to uh, hmm. even operations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So China's, you know, online healthcare market, which includes online consultations and, and drug sales, it, it's been a fast growing market in China even before COVID. And this was really largely because of, of the need, um, yeah. you know, targeting, you know, medical needs that, you know, are unmet by China's uneven access to, to healthcare. And so this is why a lot of these online healthcare platforms have, you know, really sprung up in the, the past decade. And one of the, you know, best examples is Ping On Good Doctor. This is China's largest online health provider just based on registered users. I believe it has over 300 million registered users. And specifically when, you know, COVID happened in early January and February, uh, you know, Ping On Good Doctor started offering free online telephone consultations. And because of that, the, the daily consultations spiked by, by, I believe, almost nine to 10 times. And so because of COVID, we think this year, by the end of this year, the online health market will you know, increase you know, dramatically. Um, but this is always going to happen even you know, without COVID, just because of the, the need in China to uh, do online consultations, to, to get the, the uh, medical expertise that you normally couldn't get. And so this is also another explosive growth area, which we should all keep our eyes on. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Let's, um, let's open the floor to, to Q&A. Maybe we can do 10 minutes or so. Um, what we can do is maybe you could put your, I'm going to put it in the, change my view so I can see you all. Maybe you could put your hand up and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, if you've got your videos on, uh, 
put your hand up and then we can un unmute and, and, and uh, see who's got a question. Do I see any questions? No, no hands are waving at me. I can't, does anybody have a question? I don't see any hands waving. If, if I can't see you, please unmute and ask your question. Do I see any? Jeremy, no. What, really? Nobody's got a question, aren't they a shy bunch? No worries. Ah, uh, Jens has got one. Jens has got one. All the way from Sweden. Where, where are you, Stockholm? I'm in Stockholm, yes. Hoping All to get back to Hong Stockholm. Kong soon. Yeah, yeah, well, we're opening up our, we're hoping, they're talking about opening up corridors, but I don't think Sweden's on that list. Yeah, and, and uh, well, I have to, you know, trust somewhere on the way. Now, I'm, I'm thinking about when we're coming back to more travel, and I know that, uh, for example, now the, I guess, fairly defunct Wirecard was working with WeChat to roll out WeChat. So you have a lot of tourists coming from China around the world. And when they go abroad, they wanted to pay and want to pay in the same way as they do at home. So seen, we've seen, I mean, we see WeChat terminals in, in Sweden and around that. So are there any other things like that that you think that people will bring out to the rest of the world through, thanks to sort of tourism and, and all that, not only payment, but other apps. That's a good question. And I would say definitely yes. So just off the top of my mind, um, I'll give a couple of examples. So essentially the, the question is what, what are some of the, you know, innovations or, or services that, you know, are already prevalent in China that would essentially be exported out to, to other markets, right? Yeah, and then if, you, if you're a, let's say that in the travel industry, if you're a hotel today and you don't have this app, you should probably try to get it so that you can cater to that, that the big tourism, for example, if you take tourism as, as a, or, or a... So the thing that, you know, I've noticed about um, you know, Chinese companies and Chinese apps, <clears throat> and this is across, you know, different sectors from, you know, messaging to even enterprise communications. A lot of these, you know, well-known apps in China, like, like your WeChats, like your Ding Talks or whatever, um, which mostly have been targeted at the domestic Chinese market. They've essentially created, these companies have essentially created equivalent apps targeted at international markets. So they would have one version of, let's say, um, hypothetically Ding Talk for one example, targeted at the Chinese domestic market, but an equivalent app that they put on the app store. So it's uh, applicable for you know, uh, US users. And I'll talk specifically about enterprise you know, collaboration as an example, just because this is when it comes up to my head. A lot of these companies, um, including uh, ByteDance, which is not traditionally known for uh, being an enterprise communication app. You know, they're of course known mostly for doing and short video, but they've come out with an enterprise communication app uh, for China, but also for international markets. And I believe they're currently targeting, let's say um, South America and other you know, um, markets uh, to, to essentially grow user base. So just off the top of my head, I think uh, yes, this is definitely happening um, across many different applications. Um, I, I just can't think of you know, other specific use cases right now. I think it's also very relevant to you know, markets, maybe in Southeast Asia, you see a lot of, it's where the Chinese tourists tend to go, Thailand, et cetera, right? A lot of, a lot of the hotels and you know, hospitality industry, they, they have, we accept, you know, we seen or beautiful bar, right? They accept Chinese payment uh, and chat. It's interesting what you're saying about the two versions, because obviously WeChat has a China version and an international version. Uh, apparently the international version has what, 100 million users? Is that, is that the number? I'm sure, you know, uh, the Americans are cutting that back, but let's see if we have uh, any, any, more, any more questions. Please wave to us, show us who you are. I don't see, what a shy bunch. Jeremy, Adrian, I can see a few of you out there. Nobody got a question? All right, I'll tell you what, you've done a great job. Thank you, Joey. Um, just to remind people, there's two great things about working with you. One is you've got, da -da, oops, there we are. You're offering a discount, right, to, the, to the, the full report. And I've got a copy of it, and it's not just a report, right? Maybe, can you just quickly run through? Because I really think it's worth it. It's, sounds like a lot of money, but you know, 400 US minus 120 is what? 280? 
So uh, tell us what you get for it, right? Sure. Not, not to come off too salesy, but you know, the pro edition of our China Internet Report 2020, um, I, I would say it's arguably the most comprehensive resource on the Chinese internet and technology landscape, you know, in the English language. It's, it's 130 plus pages and it'll cover the top trends um, for, for the Chinese internet. It'll cover you know, key statistics, figures, and data. And also it goes into deep dives on 10 you know, priority sectors, which includes case studies and you know, analysis and market sizing and all of that. But on top of that, you also get access to exclusive closed door webinars with uh, C-suite executive senior management of leading technology companies. So uh, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, we spoke with you know, a vice president, uh, Daisy Zhu from Huawei, talking about 5G earlier. Most recently, we sat down with Charles Lee, the chief executive of the Hong Kong Exchange, to essentially talk about the future of capital markets. Um, upcoming, we have uh, folks from Kuaishou, the short video leader, from Alibaba, from Ant Group, um, and more. So uh, it's definitely an opportunity to you know, further uh, better your understanding and knowledge of the Chinese internet landscape directly with these experts. And how does the, how does the bit I'm a bit confused by is how does this community work? What what is the community you're you're building? I mean, it sounds like an interesting community. How does that how does that work? Yeah, yeah it, it's a good question. I think it's also similar to uh, Napoleon, what you've done with Web Wednesday, and this is a fantastic community. Essentially, it would be more opportunities to to meet with like-minded individuals, you know, from different uh, industry backgrounds. Um, we'll have you know. Uh, newsletters, we'll have, you know, events, networking, we'll have opportunities to, to meet with uh, companies and experts um, and really build up our collective knowledge base. Excellent. Well, just make me one promise that you'll, uh, we'll be the first people you come to to talk about next year's report. Okay. Absolutely. Hear it yes. Excellent. You got it. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you everybody for joining and please do use the code. It's there. You can use it. Takmekia, as they say in Sweden. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody.